Uh, Caroline, thank you. If you could turn to page 205 in the proceedings and look at the graph there on productivity, where sheep have, uh, where the productivity growth has now been separated from a single figure into three 10 year groupings, and the 10 year between 90, uh, 1989 and 99. Wool had a productivity growth of minus 2.9, the worst industry in agriculture. And in the last 10 years, wool, uh, sheep have suddenly moved from the worst industry to the best industry, even beating uh, uh, cropping uh, with a growth rate of 1.4. Have either of the, uh, the wool speakers would like to talk about uh, what has brought that change around and is it sustainable and can what are in the pipeline that will keep driving that? Yeah, you go first. I'll just preface what I say. I'm, I'm not from the group that works on the productivity figures. I just want put that out there. But certainly in having listened to my colleagues from this section speak, uh, from Averes who, who work on productivity speak a bit. And knowing um, what I, I do about the wool industries, particularly in the last uh, number of years where there has been such a huge demand for sheep meat um, by the Middle East and the big push to get the flock growing, um, changing the flock to meet that demand, um, there has been a real impetus by growers to be more responsive to the changing relative prices between sheep meat and wool. It wasn't that long ago when I just started at Bears, where it was better to be producing sheep meat than it was wool, and in, in recent years, it's wool seems to be more favorable. But producers have been responsive to this because there was a large exodus of producers from the industry as the wool price was falling, but those who remained had real foresight and were targeting the, the breeding core of their flock so that they could respond to wherever the price signals were leading them. And I think that is what is reflected in these numbers. Rather than just selling off and maintaining the status quo, the producers that were left had real drive. People who, well, if you were in cotton, would be like Andrew here. But they, they knew what they had to do to stay in it. They knew what they needed out of their breeding flock. They got the best uh, rams they could to cross with their ewes. And that is what's been keeping this industry going for those who've stayed in it. And I think if it's those quality of producers who stay in it going forward, then yes, I do think it is sustainable. Like Carolyn, I won't comment on the, the precise methodology that's been applied to come up with this total fact of productivity. However, um, all I'd add to what Carolyn has said is that <clears throat> we've, in the last decade, um, since I joined AWI, I think the production of wool in Australia has declined by about 250 million kilograms between 20 and 28 microns. And we've added 60 million kilos finer than 19. So we've seen a, a very large reduction in the production in the cropping zone, the primarily. So I think that regional production is part of it. There's also a big reduction in the numbers of uh, people producing the fiber. The other enormously healthy thing has been the a huge cultural shift from people being wool fiber producers to people being sheep producers with like quad purpose animals that are producing fiber, lambs, a great carcass themselves, et cetera. So um, there's, there's a whole demographic change has occurred here, um, which is very, very positive, and it needs to be built upon. Uh, we can't have a, a great decade and um, fall away again. There's a, there's a gentleman over here that's at the microphone. Yeah, uh, Matthew Dart, uh, primary producer, South West New South Wales. My question is for Paul. I'm interested in the um, traceability aspects of, of wool. Um, I see fragmentation in, in the traceability between states and AW's thoughts, AWI's thoughts on if we're targeting wellness and, and to defend our social standing and rights, I guess, are we going to see reform to get traceability uniform across the nation so that we can then use that in a global sense? 
uh, or are we allowing states to run their own race and then try to mould it from there? So just as a point of clarification, when you talk about traceability and the state difference, is there a specific example you got for me? Well, it's fair to say Victoria with um, electronic identification oh, yeah. yep. and, uh, and New South Wales without. Yep. Uh, we as producers do electronically identify yep. now. Uh, we are not seeing a premium for that yep. currently in the market, and, uh, but we do it for our own, own use management-wise. Yep. Is there a movement within AWI to, to have traceability standardised across the country? Uh, well, there's, uh, there's two points I'll make in, in relation to that, and it's an important issue. Um, we have a very close relationship with MLA. Um, we're sort of the smaller, ugly cousin. Um, the, the traceability, the animal ID side of things is something that when we've looked at our portfolios, they handle. You know, for a long time, we've handled dogs. Uh, we've, we've sort of split things that way. We handle the wool specific stuff. So on the specifics, I'll have to um, let, let the one go through the keeper. I will say that in terms of traceability, there is, um, yeah, there's interest in it. Um, having people pay a, at the far end pay a premium for it in order to invest or to bankroll the cost is absolutely critical and in many areas has not been so evident. It's a little bit like, um, there used to be a lot of people interested in producing organic wool. They wanted to buy organic wool garments, but they weren't prepared to pay any more for it. So it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, there's a social licence. Um, it may extend to the animal ID. Um, a key issue is who pays? Is there actually at the far end of the pipeline someone prepared to invest in, in that, that choice? The only other thing I'd say is that um, the MLA have been responsible for, I think, NLIS. You might have heard of that terminology. I suspect what you'll find is in the next 12 months that that responsibility might be shifted to Animal Health Australia because it's perhaps quite important now, or becoming more important from a national biosecurity perspective. So it might be, there might be another big driver on the horizon for that technology as well. Okay, uh, we've got a question here at three microphones. Hi, Nathan Westling from McBride. i um, got a question about the price differential between fine and medium micron yep. wool. It's pretty historically low at the moment. Yep. Uh, Carolyn, I'd like to know whether that's a supply side or a demand side driven <coughs> factor. And then Paul, I want to know, uh, comparing fine and medium, whether fines jump the shark. Jump the? Jump the shark, gone like the to oblivion. Uh, in answer to your question, I think it's really a demand side factor because when you look at the distribution of the microns and the prices being offered, um, there's, well, let's not call it a surplus of the fine, but there's a lot, a much higher proportion of fine wool being produced than there used to be. And um, that is going to be going into apparel that costs quite a bit more than the medium micron. And I think given the uh, decreasing relative share of the medium micron wools, that's what's been keeping the price for those wools bolstered and therefore keeping the gap between the two price trends less than it has been historically. Yeah, yeah to me there's also, there's definitely a, a demand side thing as well, and also supply. As I said, in the last decade, we're producing uh, 60 million more kilos at that end of the spectrum per annum that we were at the start of the decade. The other thing too, there's better demand and there's been a, a long-term trend towards lighter weight fabrics that's partly driven this demand to go finer. But that's, it levels out because our fabrics can't keep getting lighter or we'll all be naked. Um, and so that's, that's also, there's a plateauing out of that, that issue. But also, as Stu and I talk about a bit, uh, there's also not enough we feel not, there's been some changes in the composition of the, in the auction room in terms of how many hands are actually bidding on that stuff at the fine end. Remembering the market works in bids of one cent or more. So that there's, particularly in the traditional super fines, there's not that much competition anymore for the traditional super fines. China's becoming very interested in that area. Um, Rui and now uh, have signed a, a, a deal with the Super Fine Wool Growers Association. That's yet to translate into prices. But I, I suspect longer term the price outlook is reasonably positive. Um, 
But as Carolyn said, there's, uh, if we've reduced our production of the 20s and up by 250 million kilos per annum, that might flow through into prices for the mediums as well. And if production increases in that area, and that's pretty much the only area of the clip where production is increasing, that on the course end, we might start, uh, expect to see prices moderate a little. But still within that <coughs> overall, a very strong market. Okay, have we got any other questions? Um, I, I will note that the speakers have all um, warranted that they will hang around after the uh, conference for, for any other questions that you wish. Has anyone got any other questions? None for Andrew? You missed out, Andrew? Uh, well, look, we'll close the uh, session there. Thanks, uh, everyone, for attending. Uh, as I said, the speakers will hang around. I think lunch is being served. Um, please uh, put your hands together for the three speakers, Carolyn Gunning-Trant, Andrew Walker and Paul Swan. Thank you.